Hello everyone, this is Gavin, GMing from the ground up, and we are getting back together for the third session of our series talking about how to start GMing your first game. And today's episode, we are going to be talking about GMing tools and how to prepare for your first session. In episode one, we talked about how to create a campaign pitch. For the second episode, you take that pitch and the players that you've got together and you determine how that pitch needs to change to get on the same page with your players, get them very excited about what's going to go on in the game. We talked about campaign safety tools, like the same page tool, like lines and veils. If you hear any banging around, Anya is setting up her recording space, getting that into a more comfy situation. So that brings us to where we're at now. We have our players, we have our pitch, we have our safety tools, and we are ready to get prepped for our first game session. So what I have here is a list of tools that will help you run a game. I'm going to start with an absolute go-to. That is fantasynamegenerators.com. They are a godsend for GMs of any game. If you can think of a type of character, creature, town or village, or, uh, land mass, fantasynamegenerators.com so a little bit more in depth is fakepersongenerator.com. This website will generate a fake social security number, fake name, gender, hobbies, birth date, uh, email address for that person. I think you can plug in the city. You can plug in gender, things like that. I don't think that one has uh, gender neutral though, but it's really fantastic. The next tool, this one's primarily online, is DroidCam X. During the pandemic, it got really hard to find high quality webcams. If your phone has a decent camera on it and can take video, DroidCam X is an Android app that allows you to uh, plug your phone directly into your computer and use your phone as a webcam. The base version of that is free. So the next free tool, one we could probably talk about for an entire uh, episode, is Google Drive. Google Drive has word processing, spreadsheets, and a whole suite of other tools. But the best thing about them is that they are so easy to collaborate on. And it's completely free. As long as you make a Google account, you get, I think, 20 gigabytes or so of free storage on there. So you can store any PDFs that you have for your game books. You can store your character sheets there for your entire group so that everyone has access to each other's character sheets. You can put just about any kind of document up on Google Docs at this point as well. It's also really good to leave comments on a document or a spreadsheet, even if you don't have edit access. So Discord, I mean, that's kind of a no brainer for all of us. Most of us hang out on Discord and use it for communication. It is, there are so many, literally tens of thousands of servers on Discord right now. A lot of them are public and easily accessible. Dice rollers online. I custom made our dice roller that we use in our Discord for Children of Midnight Coven. However, there are a lot of web-based dice rollers. Let's start with the one we use for our tabletop games online. That's dice.bbee.ac. That will generate and roll 3D dice for you so that you can visualize your dice roll. Another good one, we haven't had a chance to use it that much, is rolldicewithfriends.com. We used that on 
our Viking special last week. That is a dice generator that lets you create a virtual online room for all of the other players to join. Google Images, or any other image search platform you can find, or Pinterest are fantastic sites for getting inspired to make a character and give credit whenever you can. You can commission people to make a character drawing based on your specifications. Fiverr's fantastic. F-I-V-E-R-R dot com is another place you can go to try to find people that can do anything really. Shop local. If it's not going to cause you any uh, strife to commission your friends, then yeah, absolutely go for it. If anyone else has ideas, feel free to shout them out in chat. Hickru! Thank you for mentioning that. That is going. That is absolutely going on the list right now. But yeah, there are several pick crews that have worked out really well for us with Children of Midnight. That does remind me, another thing I've been using is Wombo. They have an Android app called Dream. Let's you put in a description and a picture. You choose how much of the image you want to remain in there and how much you want the AI to replace. You give it a little description and you tell it what art style you want to see. And it will go through and generate an image based on your description using the picture that you input as the basis. Some other products I use that are not free are the Adobe suite of apps, both for the phone and for the computer. If you are a teacher or a student, the entire Adobe suite, I think, runs you $20 a month, which is a lot. The single item I use the most is a phone app called Creative Express. It's how I make all the thumbnails, I think that pretty much hits all of those tools. So we are going to hop over. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. We're going to go from talking about GM tools specifically to how are we going to prepare for this first session of the game. And the first thing I'm going to show you is a Children of Midnight specific a little PDF I made. Okay, so what you should see on the side of your screen is our session prep PDF that I encourage people to print out a copy of. The idea with this form is that you would fill one of these out between every session. So a lot of the things you'll see on this screen are more useful between session one and session two than between session zero and session one. A good place to just keep a lot of information, let's just start at the top. So you would fill in your season and episode number, like a TV show. There's a place for you to put the names of all the player characters. Before we're going into session one, we're going to put every player character's name. And if we're still getting used to our players as well, maybe we'll throw the player name over here. Willpower and Essence, when you first start out, they're all going to be full, so you can leave those blank. You've got this Notes and Harm section. You might put something in here to help you remember something like, oh, we had talked about using this person's rival as the way of getting the first adventure started. These are not requirements, but if you have a little extra time to prepare, note any important NPCs that might be showing up in the following session. NPCs in these type of games don't need to have stats. They need a name, maybe a job, or a role. And then I have a couple of hints here. So a tag that refers to the NPC's attitude, a tag that refers to their gear, any abilities they have that are unusual, you would throw in there as tags, and their tier. Tier is an abstract 
way of looking at some character or faction's power level. Characters in these games generally start at tier zero, so if you want a faction or individual to be roughly the same power level as your player character group, then they would be tier zero. Uh, tier goes up to five. I left three little spaces here to detail out some NPCs. Generally, I would fill maybe one or two of these, and if I have a group of people, I might detail out that group. In one of our previous games, I had dock workers, and so I put dock workers. I didn't give them all names. You could put a couple of descriptive words that describe their attitude. Rough, uninterested, tough, or the way they look. Next, I have a couple spots for locations. If you have an idea about some of the locations that the player characters are going to go, you could jot those down here. It has similar tags. What makes that location unique? Say it's a warehouse with a catwalk. What makes it unique? Is it the type of materials that are being stored in the warehouse? There's a fire alarm going off while they're in there. Is it controlled by a certain faction? Give it something extra. A Google Docs version of that same sheet. It's a little bit different, but so this is where we would be putting our player character information. I still need to get character sheets from uh, everybody that's going to be playing and GMing. So for now, we're going to be leaving this blank. I put a spot for familiar. So you could put the name of the familiar and its species. That way you have it on the sheet. Yeah, that probably should have been in that other PDF. So it looks like that PDF's probably going to get an update shortly. Opening scene. Assuming that I'm the one that's that ends up running the first episode. I love to start with either in medias res, starting with the characters already involved with something. In the case of our first session of uh, Night Sky Sanctum, they started out after they had just got inside of the Museum of Modern Artifacts doing their first major heist. Another way to start similarly would be with a flashback. We could do a flashback scene as the way we would start the game. We have this uh, rich story pitch it might be a good idea for us to go back to sort of the stuff that we had figured out, the way the player characters were involved with that big ritual that went wrong. Why the player characters are still here. What their interest is. We could flash back to the ritual failing or the ritual succeeding because we still haven't really determined which of those happened. Is what happened exactly what Ascendium wanted, or did the ritual fail? What happened to the other participants of the ritual? Were they sucked into an astral realm? Were they killed? Did multiple bubble realities merge with our reality at once, and different people got sucked into different little bubble worlds? And maybe the people who were actually in charge of all this got swept away. And that might be something the player characters need to deal with. Is the person who created this ritual was the first person to vanish into a bubble world. Maybe we need to do a flashback to know what it was the players saw while they were there. That might give them a clue as to where they need to go to get more information. So these are things that we would want to figure out for this uh, first session if we were going to do it in flashback form. However, that's not the only option. We could leave more of that in the player's hands and say, we're going to focus on the here and now. We're going to focus on the repercussions and we're going to let the players tell us what happened by doing flashbacks 
you might even say, Struggle Princess, this week, I want you to tell us something that happened in a flashback and how it impacted you and, and why your character is the way they are because of what they saw in this flashback. Every episode, have a different character deliver a flashback scene, and that's all adding to the background of this game world. And then once everybody's had like one pass at that, you can take all that stuff that they just gave you and condense that, make it into a package, sort of, and say, let's do an undertaking where we resolve some, most, or all of those things that happened in flashbacks. It could be interesting, advanced uh, move to say, Let's let everybody start with one trauma, and if we successfully deal with the trauma that happened to you during this sort of pre-game event, we'll wipe that trauma off your character sheet. It could work really well in a game like this. So that's a couple ideas about sort of the way to get started. Cup your ears, listen to the players, and go in with the smallest detail of an idea that you would like to see happen in the game and go from there. And then it's a matter of you putting an appropriate obstacle in front of the player characters and seeing how they take it down to get to their goal. And then basically as the GM, your job is to just roll with the punches. The exception to that is your first session. I think it's better if you take, as a GM, just a little more charge of its direction. And the reason you're able to do that is because of all that session zero, same page tool, the lines and veils. Because the players have given you so much information, you should be able to sort of think of it like setting up bowling pins. You should be able to set up bowling pins that each of your players has a reason for wanting to knock down. It can get exhausting to do all the work. And most tabletop games force the game master to be the person that puts in all the work. Or at least the vast, vast majority. So, as an example, I might detail out an important NPC. So, we've decided that Ascendium was behind this big ritual. We're probably going to need to know who controlled Ascendium. Who was in charge. If none of the players have stepped up and said, Oh, I was the guy in charge. I'm not anymore. I'm part of this coven. We're doing our own thing. But I was the guy in charge. Well, maybe th that's fine too. But we need to know who is the, the guy in charge now. Are they trying to pick up the pieces? Are they trying to figure out why all their comrades are in the astral and they're not? So that is something the GM can do. Let's say it's a guy. He's cynical. He's jaded. He's perhaps distrustful of people now that this ritual did not go the way he expected. As far as abilities go, maybe we would, since he's an important NPC and probably had some level of power, we could get, we could come up with some ideas as a witch, what his powers were. Maybe we'd want to give him a grimoire, maybe. I don't recommend it, let the player characters have the grimoires. Just come up with a general idea about what kind of magic he does. These people are astral, so this is kind of a go-to for me, at least at the moment, but we could say he's kind of an illusionist and maybe a bit of an animist. He has some control over spirits, maybe specifically astral spirits. He could do a little things like telekinesis having spirits uh, working on his behalf to pick up items and bring them to him. Actually, that could be a kind of fun thing to do for his like whole character concept. All these little spirits that sort of come out of the woodwork to do his bidding, and you can sort of determine 
if you had all these little spirits that could do all the things for you with just a thought, what kind of person would you be? How does he treat the spirits? Does he treat them like people? Does he treat them better than people? My recommendation is three to four tags. A tag being a descriptive word or a phrase. So this character that I'm coming up with for an ability tag materializes astral spirits to do his bidding. For attitude, I would say cynical. For physical appearance, you could say, has never worked a day in his life. Soft hands. Just come up with a mental picture of what that character looks like and a name. And you're pretty much good to go. You should have enough that if the player characters decide to interact with this person, you can go off of those tags. I already hate him. Good work. <laughs> the player characters ask him something. And you can look across his tags and say... Ooh, I think he'd be antagonistic toward that question, or he's really scientifically minded, and while he might not give you the answer in the way you're expecting it, he'll probably answer you honestly, just because that's the kind of person he is. Get a general idea of how they do magic, how they cast, or what tools they use, or what their mannerisms are. You can go back to a Fantasy Name Generator, and I bet it has a quirk generator, too. So their quirk might be the he twirls his mustache incessantly, no matter what. Just run with it. Don't set anything in stone. And if you've set something into stone, don't make the player characters roll for it. Also remember, even if you have an idea about something, if it hasn't come into play yet, feel free to change it. Even if you wrote it down on your GM cheat sheet, Feel free to just strike through something. If the player characters, for some reason, immediately take a liking to an NPC, you don't have to keep that weird negative quirk that you gave them, you know, if you don't think it would suit the story. Sometimes it's fun to keep those weird negative quirks and let the player characters have some cognitive dissonance about why they like that NPC. I'm gonna do a session on game terms and like, you know, actually running the game. Although I would assume most of you have probably read the quick start guide by now. It might be a good idea for us to do a full refresher on why we do action rolls, why we do resistance rolls, what a clock is and when we use a clock, things like that. The last thing I wanted to show off was the Children of Midnight Coven cheat sheet. To help remind you of all the rules and all the roles, all the information about action roles, resistance roles, what the results mean, this can really help you, uh, especially early on, because it distills down the bulk of the 28 page quick start guide into four pages. So I'm going to write up the stuff that we talked about today, put it into Discord, and then we're going to we're going to go through the steps of actually running uh, the session. I think that all of you deserve a pat on the head and to have a good night. I will see you Friday during Anya plays. Have a good night. Bye.